Yeah, I was in the wrong room. Yeah, so. Ah, hi, Alex. Hi, yes. Hi, Thomas. Hi, all. I just uh, say hello and uh, give the floor to Thomas Menzel. He worked for me for a while, actually, and he got a much better job. And yeah, that's the way it is. He's now uh, in the Ministry of uh, Education. Is that what we call a ministerial rat? That's a very important job. He's one of the mandarins of the ministry deciding on school policy, and that's very important nowadays. He's also doing data protection, saying that he shouldn't use Dell uh, students, scholars, about the grading in public, actually in the class. But anyhow, I may change his mind. But what is here from my wife? She's also a teacher. But actually what he's now doing is, uh, he's also an expert in informatics. He has done a quite interesting book on a collection of materials in legal informatics a long time ago, but it was still very good and the tech publisher didn't do that. And so we will now speak about obscure sources in Austrian law. I promise he will speak about handwriting, what it really is, I don't know, but he will explain that. Just as an Austrian add-on to that, what, uh, our American friends have found out it's not so easy that uh, just look to the official journal and you find everything. That's not the case. There are many other sources that are quite relevant, in particular when it comes to this pandemics. So I hand over to Thomas Menzel and please you chair the session and introduce the other speakers and organize the session. Thank you for doing that, Thomas, and all others enjoy. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, you told us a lot. Yeah, I've got just some some historic feelings because Eric was my first boss after leaving university, and and I was I think for some two years a little bit more as a research fellow uh, in his institute. Uh, he was my first boss, and also gave me some great advice in lecturing, researching, and so on. But after two or three years, three years at the university, I left for public administration and did some jobs in the chancellor and now in the Ministry of Education and it went more from from a legal uh, informatics perspective to to some designing and and uh, drafting e-government um, strategy how to bring the Austrian uh, administrati administrative units to a more electronic way and the last thing is that I'm that I'm the data protection officer for the ministry and, and some kind for all the six thousand schools, but not in person. And so now I'm 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 forced to get more and more expertise in data protection. <laughs> but it's also this is quite interesting because there are a lot of, of general abstract texts, like we call that data protection impact assessments. Uh, they have to be drafted by the responsibles, but there is no um, regulation that they have to be published. But it is more or less a trend in public administration to publish them, but they are not published in the legal information system. And it's quite interesting to find, for example, this, this data protection impact assessments. And also, there is a formally there was a, a, a public register of, of data protection, there is of data of of administrative uh, data processes in the ministry. Now we don't have this this uh, database anymore, so they are also not published. But it's also quite interesting to find this very important data protection documentation. It's e more or less a bit more easy for the public sector because we are trending to publish them. But it's not so easy to find this in the private area for large concerts, for example, or large industry companies. That's quite an interesting field. Yeah, but there are some other tasks. We have a lot of administrative decrees. We are not forced to publish them, but we we are forced in another way to publish them because we have about 120,000 teachers in Austria. We have to kind of steer in the ministry. And the problem is that only the federal employee teacher, which is about half, about 60,000, we can reach directly with email addresses and all the the teachers occupied by the counties and countries, we can't even reach them with a an, with an personal email address because they have no unified email system. So we have all the, the internal administrative laws. If we want to get them in a very short time to the teachers, we have to publish them because that's the only way if we publish them at the web page of the ministry, that's the only way to reach all the teachers. 
and we don't care because if we publish a norm which is uh, which is for 120,000 persons, you can't keep that secret. Uh, so it's every norm in that area is a public norm, so we don't have any problem in publishing that. But of course, first we will give the floor to our international participant, and we are glad to hear what you are thinking in Stanford about whatever getting some information about Corona. I think so. Please, Stephen. Thank you so much, Thomas. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to share my slide right now. Give me a second. OK, great. Thank you so much for that yes. introduction, Thomas. Um, I'm joined. My name is Stephen Keynes. I'm a residential fellow at Codex. And I'm here joined today by my co-founder, Daniel Carvajal. And together, we started Corona Atlas a few months ago. So Corona Atlas is hosted at the Codex Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford Law School. And we are a computational law center. So the COVID-19 crisis in the United States, uh, a lot of the effects are similar to across the globe. This is clearly a health crisis. And right now we have rising numbers of hotspots and new cases. Different states and cities are finding some waves now. And we have a lot of legal crises looming. So for instance, evictions are a big issue coming up and we have delayed a lot of the courts or closed some of them. So we're anticipating a huge kind of legal backlog of issues. And economically, as I'm sure as many of you are aware, about 20 million Americans lost their job in one month in April, and this unemployment or loss and loss of health insurance, which often exacerbates the health crisis. So our project, um, the key feature is a regulatory map that tracks COVID-19 related mandatory orders across the U.S. at the federal, state, and local level. And as I mentioned before, these orders can kind of connect to health, business, housing, and other areas. And it's key to note that there are thousands of these jurisdictions across the U.S. and they're each responding to their crisis in their own manner. A key feature of the U.S. response is not is the fact that they, it is not a centralized response. There are many jurisdictions, many many policymakers, many lawmakers kind of making decisions for their own um, communities at this different granular level. So it's a task to collect all of the information. Um, I mentioned U.S. jurisdictions, and I'm sure many of you are aware of how the U.S. is set up. But just as a quick overview, we have the federal government. We have, have 3,141 counties and county equivalents approximately. Um, and then we have 19,522 cities approximately too. So there are a lot of jurisdictions which create a lot of opportunities for different orders and different things to be published. So to classify some of these health orders that we're referring to, uh, one type would be an executive order, which is issued by governor of a state and that's binding on everybody in the state, including all the counties and all the cities. You have proclamations, which may make emergency funds available by declaring a public health emergency. You also have health mandates that are issued by the public health department. So those might be mass requirements. And then you also have often judges who often administer county orders. So there's a wide variety of people who are empowered to issue orders within the United States. And it's key to recognize the differences between mm -hmm. each of the bodies. So categories, right? We have a number of categories. We have around 22 and the list is growing. And I won't read all these here to you, but as you can see, some of these are a little bit more general. So for instance, the stay at home order affects everyone, but clearly issues such as like those kind of orders only affects homeless populations and jails and prisons similarly. So we wanted to make sure, so even though there's some overlap between some of these categories, uh, a key feature we wanted to kind of point out was that a lot of these issues do have kind of their own distinct um, considerations. So while there may be some overlap, we tried to kind of categorically place each of these orders in a different box, if you will, so that way we can see connections between different orders from different places and issued at different times. Um, so to give you an example of what one of these sample order looks like, this is an order from Orange County in Florida, and it's about social distancing and face coverings. So when we say social distancing, we're referring to, for instance, keep six feet apart. For instance, restaurants may be capped at only 50%, and then face coverings obviously clearly translates into mass. One key thing about these orders is if you notice in the preamble, they reference an earlier date. So the date of this order is May 1st, but on March 13th, they kind of tell you what of the uh, assumptions and underlying facts that the legislators are working for. So it's key to know kind of um, what are the facts that they're assuming when they're issuing these orders, and it kind of gives you a peek into the mind of the legislators so that you know where they're coming from. And to give you an example, this is a senator, and this one's out of Texas. And it's interesting to note, too, just the way that these orders are written are obviously in standard legalese, and I'm sure as many of us are aware, the general public often has a little bit of trouble interpreting legal um, contracts and legal language. So we'll, we're going to elaborate a little bit as to how we're going to address that gap. One key thing I want to point about this is that the last sentence at the bottom, it actually references an earlier declaration or piece of uh, legislation. And we found that a lot of these orders actually 
relate to each other um, in that manner. So it's not even just about the single or often, you can almost make a relation a relational network of different orders. And the reason why they might reference something earlier is that they could terminate it, as you see in this one. So they say that's no longer valid, or they could amend it, they could modify it, they could add to it. So it's very key to know when one document cites another one that you relationally pull that and make sure you have that too, so you have a thorough understanding of what's going on. So now we'll move to what are important com components in common language that are found in these orders. So the f and uh, it's key to note that there are multiple types of, there may be a date that an order is announced or the intention to issue an order is announced. You may have the date effective, the date it was actually signed. At times there are grace periods, meaning that they'll give you three, four, five days to kind of adjust to the order. So for instance, if a county enacts a mask order and they give you a grace period of five days, it means you will not be penalized for wearing your mask in those five days. Subsequent I give people time to adjust. Um, the other issues are uh, jurisdiction. So we talked about how orders can be issued at the federal level, the state, the city, the county level. And these jurisdictions are within a clear hierarchy too. They have different considerations about preemption and understanding, for instance, that if the state mandates something, the city can't override it. Um, and then third, you also have amendments and updates, which I mentioned before. And then finally, the signature issuing body author. Um, there was an issue in the state of Wisconsin about the enforceability of the stay-at-home provisions that the Wisconsin Supreme Court took on. So we're seeing very interesting issues about whether the enacting body also has the authority to do so. Generally in the U.S. they do, um, and that's a, there are a lot of exemptions. But for the most part, a lot of these orders have not been uh, successfully challenged. But the Wisconsin one stands out as an outlier within this. But it's also key to know who is signing these orders and what, where their authority comes from to make these types of decisions. So now we move on to what are some of the unique challenges of these orders? So we mentioned centralization. Imagine each of those 19,000 cities, they each have their own website and they each have their own orders. So once compounded with um, the county orders and also the state orders, you can easily see how this problem grows to hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of orders. An example we have here is in Miami-Dade, which is a county within Florida where, is my, where Miami is. And right now there's 75 orders. And that could easily, as I mentioned before, this could compound once you add all, even just like, let's say, the cities alone in one state. So you have thousands of orders, and they're all drafted slightly differently. Sometimes you've had issues where counties that are literally lying next to each other are tackling issues very differently and have different responses. Um, so I mentioned some of the preemption when it comes to the federal government and states kind of having power over the smaller units of municipal. So there are issues of jurisdiction. So for instance, some cities actually lie in two counties. So the city is either effectively divided by those two counties. And so part of the rest of residents are kind of being, a, um, what's the phrase, uh, dictated by the orders of one county and the others are of another. So it's kind of very clear to delineate and determine what are some of these jurisdictional issues that you may come across. And then the final point before I hand it over to my co-founder, Daniel, is we're dealing with non-standard data. So we've talked a lot about how the content of these orders are different, but it's also crucial to mention that the websites in which they reside are also non-standard. And also the document formats, formats also vary. So there could be PDFs, there could be text, and uh, this is just a manner in uh, which they differ. So it's just key to know it's non-standard data. So now I will stop sharing and I'll turn it over to my co-founder, Daniel, to give us a technical overview of our project. Okay. Thank you very much for that for that uh, detailed introduction and, 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 and um, Stephen, for that uh, for that detailed overview. Um, now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the how the data is, um, how it exists, and and where those orders are getting published. Um, so, like Stephen mentioned, there in the United States, there are up to we estimate 22,000 jurisdictions. Um, just doing a ballpark estimate, and for those different jurisdictions, the the health orders are actually published on different websites. So there are thousands of different websites where these health orders are being published. Um, and aside from the, from the orders being on, on a variety of different websites, the format of the orders themselves can actually vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, both on the language and the structure. So although there are some similarities, uh, there are also some distinctions across states and counties. So one solution that we found is to use uh, scraping technology. And a general definition for, for scraping is essentially a specialized tool which is assigned to accurately and quickly extract information from a web page. And so uh, this has actually been around for, for quite a while now. And we figured this would be a good way that we could try to centralize some of those orders from, from the different jurisdictions and, and try to create a centralized database. So as you can see here, uh, here's an example website which holds the executive's orders. 
This one specifically is uh, from Texas and these executive orders were issued by the governor. And so on the left, you can see a screenshot taken from the website itself and you can see it's relatively well organized and there are links. Um, you can see executive order 25, 24 and so on. And those are actually links directly to the PDF files which contain the orders. On the right, you can see a screenshot as well of the underlying HTML of the website. The HTML is essentially the, the markup language which, which holds all the code <clears throat> to render the website so the user can see um, the presentation of the website. So using scraping technology, we can automate the process of retrieving data from a website and no, we no longer have to do it manually. We can try to automate this process. And so on the bottom right, you can see there, it says XPath. And so this, this one line command essentially allows us to extract all the, all the PDFs files from the Texas government page. You can essentially use the, the developer tools in Chrome, nothing too fancy, it's, it's very standard. And you can put in this one line command and it will give you back all the files. So this is very standard practice, um, it's called XPath. And this is something that we wanna use in conjunction with scraping technology to be able to centralize these orders. On this next slide, we can see a similar example. Now, this is the, the previous one was at the state level. This one um, is at the county level. Now, just because the state level is um, higher in the, in the hierarchy than the county, it doesn't mean that the state website holds all the orders for the county. Um, actually, the counties themselves have the orders um, issued at the county level, and the, the state level has only those. So that, that's why it's not all centralized. It's all very, uh, very spread out. So this example, we can see the, the Miami-Dade website, and it's a similar format. On the left, you can see a screenshot that has all the orders very neatly organized and, and in PDF format. And on the right, you can see the underlying code of the website, which is relatively standard, and, and we can interact with it very, in a very straightforward way to, to try to extract that data, as you can see with this command on the bottom left as well. <clears throat> So one of the popular tools that we found to, to implement the scraping process is called Scrapey. It has been around for years and it's <laughs> probably the most popular scraping tool used nowadays. It has built one of the largest communities around it and, and a large set of experts that, that have been working with this tool for a while. So we figured it, it would be a, a good fit for our project. <clears throat> now in terms of collecting the orders, um, the file in which they exist and in which they're published uh, can vary. So most of the orders are in PDF format and those can simply be downloaded. In some of the cases, and this is very rare, we've seen that the orders can be presented in text form or they can be um, maybe other summaries relating to the order. And anything that's in text form, we can either download the raw HTML or, or try to extract that process data using some of these scraping technologies. But for our focus, the, the, most of the orders have been in PDF format. And the two ways in which the PDFs can come is either a PDF that contains strictly, strictly text. And that's actually what we consider to be better quality because we can extract that text in a relatively straightforward manner. Imagine if you opened up the document and you copied and pasted the text, it's just there. Um, but in the not so good cases, uh, the PDFs can sometimes contain images which have been scanned. So they can maybe contain um, some sort of document which was, which was scanned or a picture of the text, and it's not as easily accessible to plot that text. So it's, it's not always as, as clear as how to, how to handle those cases. Luckily, we found a tool that's been around for a little while now. It's called Apache Tika. And Tika is, is a, like I mentioned, a popular tool, and it's commonly used to, to extract data and text and metadata from PDFs and other types of documents. So in our case, it's very convenient because Tika can also handle images from scanned files. So it's, it's very convenient for our process. Here we have a flowchart that I put together um, of what we hope to implement. And so on the left, you can see Scrapey, which was the, the very popular scraping tool that I mentioned earlier. And with this, we can um, automate the, the download process of all the orders. And then we can try to enrich that data um, down, down the chain use, using Tika or something else. And once we extract that data, we hope to do human supervision on it and, and work with people um, and other experts to really try to clean up the data and better understand it 
And hopefully once we have that data collected, we hope to either publish it, um, make it more accessible, or try to publish studies and, and collaborate with experts and data analysts to, to really try to understand um, how, these, how the health situation played out in the United States. Here we have a screenshot of how the website currently stands. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the, the flowchart that I just showed you is something that we're currently prototyping and we're, we're putting all the pieces together. Um, on our website, at the moment, we have a legislative database that's uh, a little more straightforward. We currently are tracking the links to the health orders and we're tracking a news article that goes along with that order that sometimes give a little bit of a, a more casual explanation. And that ties to what Stephen men mentioned earlier about public legal literacy. We figure that including these new sources could help um, individuals understand the language of these orders a little bit better. Although we, we've also found that the news articles aren't always necessarily the clearest um, at explaining all the details of the order, but that's something that, that we can discuss um, at another time. But like I mentioned, the website at the moment, we're tracking the URLs, we're tracking a, a news article in accordance with it. We're also tracking the jurisdiction, uh, the date in which it was published. And we also have um, categories, like Stephen mentioned, that go along with it and, and, and what the order relates to. Here's a little bit of a, a more detailed overview of all of that. Um, but the one thing I haven't mentioned that we also have on the website is we have external health data from different sources. Currently, we're, we're showing um, confirmed cases of COVID, and you can zoom into your state and, and go through the different orders and also get some of, the, some of the health data as well so you can have a better understanding of the situation in your state. We, uh, we, our map is also interactive as well, so you can choose your state or county and zoom in and, and find out all the orders that have been issued in, in your jurisdiction. And like I mentioned, currently on our, on, our, on our website, the database that we have has all been uh, manually collected. Another section of the website is uh, an area where we have resources and we provide both a means for individuals to take action and try to get involved or donate to, to ongoing causes and either donate personal protective equipment or things alike. And we also have a section which provides more of a and read um, content that you can read and also um, assistance, resources, and, and, and other financial assistance, things that you can, that you can find that, that could assist you. And yeah, with that in mind, I think that that was a, a good overview of what we wanted to go over today. So now I'm going to hand it back to Steven, and, and he can tie around the details about the orders in the US. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so much, Daniel. And so I'll just share screen again. All right, so now let's just briefly discuss the future of COVID orders in the States. So there's no doubt that orders will continue to be issued. Um, even if we move into reopening certain secure we need orders and able to do that. And we found new structures, for instance, de defining each area by the phase of reopening, for instance, that we can also integrate into our UI UX so people have that knowledge and they zoom into their state, into their county or their city. And there's also issues with just mitigating subsequent waves. No guarantee pandemic will ever be at least like in the next immediate future, but um, orders will be needed and kind of uh, guide the public and society. With so no doubt that the, the necessity to have all orders organized in a centralized and uniform manner will hold value over the, over the future. Um, second, just the kind of volatile economy and high employment that we're going to continue to see will kind of cause greater needs for policy shifts. And that's something that we're also thinking about getting into. And then finally, um, other technical and technological initiatives like contact tracing, I'm sure as many of you are aware of being deployed in Europe and across the world. And um, that's almost like another stream of health data that we can also implement in the future. But um, other technologies will also influence the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. So it's crucial to all these innovations. Typically for our projects, yeah. Our next steps, uh, we're going to continue to build our pipeline. So uh, the scraping pipeline that we showed you uh, is what's in process right now, but we're working on finalizing it. And then uh, also just making sure we have all the websites to represent the different municipalities. Um, we want to build back in so we support more operators, uh, more partners and volunteers. And then we also want to expand our legislative scope. Um, I'm sure as many of you are aware, there's been recent a lot of civil unrest in regards to uh, the police brutality in the United States. And this has also resulted in some legislative shifts. So for instance, things as simple as the banning of chokeholds, but also the reallocation of certain funds 
could be something that could be tracked and it would be of interest to us in the next future, in the near future, rather. And then finally, just grow our team. So we would like to attract more collaborators, volunteers, and partners. We're in conversations with a few uh, other universities and institutions on expanding and looking for the future. Um, but that's really where we're going. And if anybody has any interest in collaborating, please shoot us an email. Um, and just a, a final note, one that we had for this project was to be able to create an extremely clean legal data set. So health professionals, specifically epidemiologists, can review, um, let's say, similar communities of similar size and demographics that reacted differently to the pandemic. So let's say one did a full shelter in place, which is very restrictive, and then the other just did a curfew between certain hours. Um, although there's going to be intervening factors, like I think there are interesting inferences that you can draw from similar communities who responded differently with different legislative actions. And so a lot of tracking right now is only about the health and it's only about the IC capacities, but I, we do believe that there is a lot of data underlying um, the kind of legal realities and everything. So if we can organize that, streamline it, and kind of boil down a lot of these frameworks for the medical workers, then we can also provide aid in this way to the crisis. So just as to close, this is our team. As I mentioned, I'm currently a resident fellow at Codex. I'm the project lead. In the middle is Michael Genezareth, who is our principal investigator, and who's actually now at a different session. And then finally, Paul Carvajal, who is our lead engineer and chief product officer. And uh, yeah, we are Corona Atlas. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it, and I'll turn it over to the other chairs. Okay, Stephen and Daniel, thanks for your interesting ideas and presentation and thoughts. Uh, yeah. Quite interesting. I'm, I'm not sure I have to say it's a technical question. Uh, we have 22 listeners, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure how they will how they will uh, draft their questions, but maybe we will see if something happens on the screen. Um, uh, I think we'll draft in the chat function. Um, there's a session button. Everyone just posted a message. So I, I can't understand you very fine. It's, it's the, the, not, the quality is not so fine. Oh, sorry. It a function to the right of the yeah, screen. Yeah, but there is a, in the chat, at least it's quiet in the chat at the moment. Right. So, Maria, yeah. I will I will start with one question. Uh, at least I have the <laughs> I have the privilege to do this orally. Uh, you you showed us quite an interesting way to to automate all this text scraping. At the moment, you're focused on Corona rules and and text. Do you think there is also another fields of regulations? For example, I, I think there, there are a lot of tech-related uh, norms, not only laws, but also technical norms in, in the field of digitalization, in the field of communication. Do you think this could be also interesting for, for developing, a, I don't know, a, a tech atlas, and a communication atlas, or something like this? Uh, is there any, uh, any um, science tasks in this direction? Yeah, can, can you, is your tool possible to, to, to put some, some totally different field of and the same techniques, I think, will also work for a different field of law regulation? Is, is it yes, is there much? Sorry, yes, yeah. Absolutely, Thomas. That's a great question. So you're right. We did build a framework that you can adapt to different fields of information. So I think if you mm -hmm. just mentioned regulations would be another great way to display this. And it really is just the issue of centralization, I think, is at the core. Like, there are so many different types of city and county websites. And just kind of even just doing this project has really opened my eyes to how there's very little standards when it comes to how the government is relaying their legislation. And it was something so serious that has so many consequences to our daily lives. I think it's very vital that we kind of standardize and get this right. So I definitely agree that there are other fields that we can implement. I mentioned uh -huh. some of the police reform going on in the United States. Contact tracing efforts could also be another great one. Um, Daniel, do you have any other mm -hmm. thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, but I mean, I, okay. I think that I think this framework could very easily apply to um, to other cases, considering that the underlying problem is similar, which is the documents would be spread out through a variety of different websites. Now, we hope to um, potentially try to find different ways that we can do the scraping in a little bit more of an intelligent way. So um, I've seen that artificial intelligence is getting thrown around and we we're always looking into supervised machine learning techniques that we could try to find sources in a better way. But yeah, I do think that this 
that this model could easily carry out to to address other problems as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, let's let's wait to see if something is doing in the chat or somewhere else or hear something, but at least in the chat, it's silent at the moment. Are there any other questions from from the persons I see on the screen? They're all very deep listening, <laughs> very concentrating in looking. I think I will address my questions after my presentation. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So maybe we can we can try a different mode. We can save some some time and go to the next presentation. Maybe we'll find after all the presentations um, not a slot for for more or less intensive discussion uh, general on all the topics presented. Mm -hmm. in a minute. So from this uh, academic but also very practical point of view, I think as think so. We are going to some very practical point of view because um, Stefan Hasenauer is a lawyer and so he is a heavy user of, of legal databases, legal information. Um, I know some, some colleagues in, in from my from my time at the university and, and also how at least in ten years ago and or five years ago the law companies did their research and I think this was a lot of manual labor and also there were a lot of students paid to go to public administration authorities and wherever to find the the according documents and to dig deep uh, to find something which will help your clients in in front of court but maybe there is a more smarter way to do that Stefan, you yeah thank you very much about that. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much for the introduction um, my name is Stefan Asenauer and I'm an associate uh, here at Benita Rechtsanwälte. And just a moment, try to share my screen. <clears throat> can you see my, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh. And in my today's presentation, I want to talk about the uh, fragmentation of legal information sources in Austria. Uh, what I want to do is that I want to give an overview about the current state of access to legal information sources in Austria and uh, where problems of, uh, in legal advising arise due to the fragmentation of, due to the still existing fragmentation of such uh, legal information sources. Mm -hmm. So at first some, um, I want to give two definitions. What are legal sources in this context? Legal sources uh, are laws and case law basically and legal information sources would be the databases or the access points where uh, you can find these legal sources. And uh, what problems does a legal practitioner have? Now he needs to he needs to have the legal sources um, to solve the legal issues, and by doing that he has to take it, to take into account several levels here in Austria: uh, the European level, the national level of the government, then the states level of the Bundesländer, and uh, the municipalities, and. <clears throat> Here we have a sort of uh, fragmentation of central importance is in Austria the Rechtsinformationssystem uh, of the government, the RIS. Um, but you also have many other legal information sources on different websites. So here on this slide is uh, kind of an overview of the legal information sources and also of some of the legal information sources. And as I mentioned, the central platform of uh, central importance is the uh, RIS. Um, and RIS uh, is the only source for the authentic electronic publication of law in Austria. And other legal information sources, uh, which can be seen on this slide, I will uh, explain in detail on the following slides. So the general information 
So what can be found uh, on Rees and what can be found on other platforms regarding legislation? Uh, on Rees you, you can find all federal laws since approximately 2004 and all laws of uh, the states since, depends on the state, but since approximately 2015, they are all uh, in the Rees and only a few decrees of the municipalities. And on other platforms that are basically the municipality, the websites of the municipalities, you can find the decrees or many decrees of the municipalities. Regarding case law, you have, you can find all decisions of the highest courts, of the three highest courts in Austria uh, in Ries since the early 1990s. And all decisions of uh, lower administrative courts but only very few decisions of district courts, of regional courts, and higher regional courts. Uh, and only very few decisions of some selected public authorities, like the Data Protection Authority. Case law on other platforms would be, for example, uh, the FinDoc, which I will explain later. This uh, about case law and tax matters, uh, or the website of the Regulatory Authority for Broadcasting and Telecommunications where you can find decisions by the authority. So um, if you want to interpret the law correctly, um, you, have, you have to use other sources um, which can't be found on the, on the RIS. And so other sources would be, for example, preparatory legislative materials, which you can find on the uh, website of the parliament, um, decrees and other information on websites of the ministries, guidelines um, on tax matters, on the FINDOC, materials of, on social security issues and statements, interpretations uh, of other authorities, which I will uh, explain on the next slides. So let's take a closer look at uh, these other legal information sources. As I've already mentioned, uh, regarding municipalities, uh, many of them, or almost all, all of them, have their own websites where you can find where they publish decrees and other information. And larger municipalities, such for example the city of Salzburg, also publish official journals of um, where you can find their decrees and announcement also on the websites. Uh, regarding labor law. Um, it's very important to uh, take a look at uh, collective agreements. This, these are binding agreements which are concluded between the organizations representing the employers and the employees. And these uh, collective agreements can't be found in RIS. So um, you have to use the uh, website of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. There the uh, collective agreements um, can be downloaded. Regarding banking law and capital markets law, um, the, the website of the Financial Market Authority will be um, the, the place where you have to go. Yeah, there you can find links to the applicable provisions in RIS, uh, links to EU law, but also guidelines of the FMA and, um, on certain issues and comments, which are all needed if you want to correctly interpret the law. And you can also find he uh, helpful tools like uh, company databases where you can find what um, concessions a bank have, for example, or uh, investor warnings or information about sanctions and so on. Um, with respect to competition law and antitrust law, um, there is the, uh, the competent authority would be the Federal Competition Authority. And on this website, you can find views on the general competition law issues of the authority and also information on mergers that were granted or, or not. <clears throat> Regarding tax law, um, the, the central information point would be the, the so-called FINDOC. It's the financial documentation of the Ministry of Finance about tax and tariff-related questions. And you can also find ca uh, guidelines of the uh, ministry there and decrees and questions and answers uh, on international tax law and also uh, case law on tax matters. 
when it comes to uh, insolvency cases, uh, the addict database or the addicts that I would be um, is the the website where you can find um, information on insolvency proceedings, <laughs> court auction, but also information about court auctions, involuntary administration, edicts of uh, land register courts and companies register courts, and also announce some announcements and uh, selected decisions of the cartel court. Regarding intellectual property law, um, the competent authority is the patent authority and uh, where you can find announcements and very important for legal research, also databases um, to search for trademarks, patents and uh, designs. And regarding telecommunications law, the regulatory, regulatory authority for broadcasting and telecommunications is um, the competent authority and also on this website you can find edicts and announcement as well as decisions of the uh, authority. And regarding social security law, the SOTSTOC is um, uh, the important database where you can find uh, documentation of the Austrian social security law and as well as implementing regulations and international and international law and legislative preparatory works and court decision also decrees uh, by the Ministry of, so of uh, Social Affairs. Um, only just to mention two other platforms which uh, only have only give general information basically for the general public uh, and especially for entrepreneurs we have uh, Unternehmen Service Portal um, where you can find information about uh, for example how can I found a company in Austria so now by using two examples I would like to describe um, what uh, this fragmentation means from the perspective of someone who has to apply the law in Austria. So the first example would be uh, regional planning. Regional planning in Austria is uh, a power of the states. So the states uh, have to pass, uh, it's, each state has to pass its own regional planning law. Um, they are all available in Ries. Uh, however, the implementation of land use plans and develop, land development plans um, is the responsibility of the municipalities. And these land use plans and land development plans are decrees of the municipalities uh, and they can't be found in RIS. Some of them are online as maps, uh, but others uh, must be looked at physically at the respective municipal office. <clears throat> On some websites of the municipalities, you can find uh, announcements in PDF format of the Publication that new um, land development plans uh, have been published. The second example would be a building law similar to regional planning law. A building law um, lies within the power of the states and the implementation uh, is the responsibility of the municipalities. And laws and decrees in building law often refer to construction regulations, uh, norms, uh, normen, and guidelines of um, the Austrian Institute for Building Technology, which are also not uh, available in RIS. Then you have a problem that uh, I mentioned before that regarding civil law, you um, only decisions of the highest courts are available in RIS and just selected decisions of courts of lower instance um, are available online. So the other, most of the uh, decisions of law of courts of lower instance are uh, generally not available. And likewise, um, many decisions of public bodies, uh, such as the building authorities, are also not public available. What you can find on the websites of uh, some municipalities 
are announcements of public hearings concerning uh, the uh, concerning proceedings or uh, to to the approval of to the approval of business facilities, um, which are published either on the website of the municipality or uh, or the administrative authority of the district. Hmm. Um, so um, an additional fragmentation of legal information so uh, sources not only comes from uh, Austrian level, but uh, because of the EU level, because um, when you give legal advice, you have also to consider EU law, and EU law is available uh, generally on the OLX platform, uh, especially when it comes to directly applicable um, EU law, which is not transposed in Austria. And also for the EU case law um, of the European courts, you have to uh, consult the courier, the uh, platform of the European courts. And here you have the same uh, as with uh, Austrian law. It's not enough to only look at the law. You also have to look at the other sources. And here the other sources are basically the guidelines of the European institutions, which are all which are generally published on the websites of the respective institutions. Mm -hmm. For example, the guidelines of the European banking authorities are published on the um, website of the EBA. So if you are into data protection law, uh, the guidelines, uh, recommendations, and best practices of the European Data Protection Board would be of interest. And uh, regarding the uh, financial market, the guidelines and technical standards of the European Securities and Markets Authority um, would be of main interest. So what conclusions uh, can be drawn from this? There is already comprises a large part of the Austrian legal sources. However, access to additional legal information is still uh, fragmented. So for example, uh, decrease of municipalities or certain uh, case law, or even uh, not available electronically. And the same is true for materials who need to correctly interpret the law, the guidelines and for on tax issues, for example, uh, on Austrian level as well as um, on European level. And an additional uh, fragmentation also results from the need to consider uh, EU law and EU case law. <clears throat> so much of the information um, is already available online, for example, on different websites in different uh, formats, such as HTML or PDF. Um, but there is no central access point or central cover it all search engine that would make it easier to find and search resources. So um, you have to know where to look if you um, want to um, have a thorough uh, research on a certain issue. Yep. Mm. Thank you very much. That was my presentation. Okay. Stefan, thanks a lot for this perspective of the lawyer side. Um, yeah. Uh, what what I'm missing in your conclusions, or, or at least what uh, other question, what are you missing most in, in your practical way? Uh, what what is what what information, legal information you need to to help your clients? What is the uh, the most hard, the hardest to to contain to collect? Um, yeah, for me, it's it's generally other sources. The, the guidelines of the authorities, you really need them if you want to um, give good advice. So, for example, the, as I'm in data protection law, you have to know that there is an European Data Protection Board, which mm. um, uh, provides information and provides guidelines and provides opinions, because if you don't know that and only look at uh, the law, um, you don't know what uh, how the um, authorities would decide or how to think about um, certain issues. And uh, it takes time to 
um, get to know where all the sources are. So when when you come from the uh, university, you know you know okay there is a res uh, where I can find all laws and where I can find the uh, uh, decisions and you know okay uh, there are the I forgot to mention that we also have commercial databases in Austria where you can find the commentaries and where you can find um, uh, articles and so on. But um, and you get to know with it, but you don't know these other sources. At least it was for me, and it, it takes time to um, get to know where the sources are. Um, and as far as I know, we have no. Um, we have no search engine or database where you can search for all these um, things. Yeah, it's called Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> but how and much you Google. trust Google? <laughs> I have to say, maybe you can, you can now, you can, you can um, find me or something else. In the practice way, I'm just doing my 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 research. If I'm using just the text of a federal law, I'm just typing in Google Ries blank and then the short the abbreviation of the law. And for most of the law, it works. It gives me a deep link to the to the federal norms, to the fitting federal norms in Ries. It's quite quick, <laughs> but but of course it doesn't work for very specialized for what and something like this. But but. To, to find quick, uh, uh, bigger federal law, it, it works with Google quite fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um, many of these, um, as I said, many of these would be already online. So um, they could be, um, like I explained in the um, ex presentation before, they could be um, made available very easily. Yeah, and, and I also think because I'm, I'm doing a little bit more, it's, it's a bit of hobby or, or just to do some, I do, I do some teaching in, in higher education and also in, in, in practice teaching our new employees. They are not lawyers, so they are not professionals in, in searching legal texts and interpreting and using legal texts, but it's even more for quite interested citizens to find the correct legal information they need. It's quite harder because they don't have the education Mm -hmm. uh, to work with laws, every lawyer and every jurist has. So this is also very interesting how you can train, for example, and an 17 year old um, schoolboy or schoolgirl how to find information about the new, uh, I don't know, the new poll about climate, uh, the new climate survey or whatever we have now, which is interesting for them. Mm -hmm. This is also there. You can teach them a bit about this and but going deeper in the material is there is no time and also in 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 school positively mm -hmm. let's say one hour a year about doing legal uh, information techniques in in schools mm -hmm. yeah there yeah. is not so easy to use you have to take uh, mm -hmm. some time uh, until you know how to, to use it yeah. okay yes so i think the other we will, if it's okay, we will go to the to the next, uh, to the next speech. Christian Sageda, I think he specialized as a, let's say as a company. Is this correct in, in doing uh, professional tools for lawyers and, and uh, giving them professional tools for for legal information retrieval and also selling this to customers? Is this correct? And, and also, but also doing it from from a little bit scientific perspective. Please yep. proceed what you have found out. Okay. One second. But it's quite interesting if you're looking at, at the number of our of our listeners, they are quite growing. We started with 21 and now it's 24. So <laughs> every every uh, lecture we will have one or two more. So maybe we will end with 30 <laughs> or something like this. Okay, may I introduce myself a little bit? Um, yeah. I'm Christian Sakida. I am the managing director of Cybly. And we have one famous product here in Austria running, uh, which is Open Laws. And on top of Open Laws, there's one very famous application, which is the RIS app, which we did with the Austrian government together. So we were a able to get the RIS um, data over an open data interface earlier than, let's say, others at the beginning. And nowadays, this data is also free for everyone else to use it. 
but at the beginning of the project, this is now six years, six or seven years ago, um, we got this data already up front before there was even an open government, open data interface from, from the RIS side. Um, we have a lot of experiences already uh, harvesting different data sources. So we are harvesting um, data from the RIS platform. We are harvesting also the data from in a structured way from Eurolex. We have interfaces also for the German um, legislation and case law. Um, but also based on this, what Stefan Hasenauer said, um, it's it needs more uh, additional data sources um, to get uh, a full picture of the of the legal landscape uh, here in Austria or even here in, within the on a European level. The thing is, um, if I continue with sorry, don't want. Uh, with um, the numbers already we had already for the US or for mm -hmm. Austria, we have here in Austria approximately 2,095 um, municipalities which are publishing their information um, on their own website, which having different structure, they don't look even similar or something like this. And on this, to find this information on each of these websites is really a quite uh, challenging effort. If we would extend it to Germany, we would have already to have this in, uh, this um, harvesters for more than ten thousand um, cities. And in this case, um, if you do things like this on a, a manual base, uh, I, I think it will be even if you code for each of them. Uh, an own harvester or something like this, uh, it takes you ages to do this, even if it's only a few lines of codes for each of them. But to our experiences, this data, this website changes quite often. So they're having changes in the structure of their HTML. So what is valid today will no longer be valid tomorrow even on the open data interfaces. So even if this website still looks like ha as before, they maybe have changed uh, the, their backend system before they had a WordPress site. Now they have another Joomla and this uh, doing the heading in different marking. So all your X passes will no longer work. Or for example, um, even with, with Veta data, you're getting on a public interface, they're filling out the, the XML structure, which is, has never changed yeah, in a different way so that the information you're looking now is uh, in a different XML field as they have done it. This is, uh, I think, one of the most challenging uh, when you add multiple data sources. And if you then uh, provide a search functionality for it, you have to think about how you provide for this let's say a huge number of municipalities, um, uh, also some certain clever filtering or presentation. So if you go, for example, if I type in in Austria, for example, for uh, Baurecht or building construction, yeah, um, as long I'm looking on a very general term, it doesn't make sense to up um, 2,095, uh, 95, different results for all the municipalities here in Austria. So you have really to think about also how you present the data and giving the customer the, the possibility to scale down this information when he needs to get this information. So really you have to think when you present what in your result set, because otherwise you only fill up the result sets with additional thousands of documents and then again, you can go back to Google because there you get with each term you type in um, thousands of results and you have to click through all the results uh, or going through this. So, so this is um, the main thing. And often when you, in our case, for example, we not only um, linking back to the original website where the data is, uh, came from, we also present this data in our application. 
So we have also to think about how to present this additional data, which if it's a PDF, um, you can present it um, like the PDF. But if you look like uh, GDPR in Europe, it doesn't make <clears throat> sense to point the customer to a document which is uh, in a printout 200 pages. Because yes, you have st he was looking for some guidelines in the GDPR and he gets now a link to a document with 200 pages and say, look inside the document, you will find it something. This is what Google tells you. And I think this is not the, the, the right way. So here the different things started. So I want to come back to a little bit to the challenges. If you have a crawler, yeah. so we can have a crawler and we can hand code them. But I have so everyone, we have not 10,000 of developers which can now develop for each of these municipality websites and something that they are able to we grab the right information. So even if we want to all the legislation which is coming from the municipality, not only maybe the corona information as uh, the colleagues in Stanford are doing, so if you want to grab also other ones, we have to find them on the website. Besides all other news feeds, because we are not interested in this, that there is the next week uh, uh, some event going on or something like this, because <clears throat> in this information we are not interested. So we really have to filter this information. We can think about a little, uh, more intelligent scrollers, which are even having some support from artificial intelligence. Um, but here it's getting the, the more the challenge um, of training the data. So I know from projects uh, only to find the terms and condition um, on websites if they are not linked directly through the photo or something like this. <clears throat> um, it was not so easy to train the system and the training already um, needed at this time approximately 1,000 websites um, where, they, where we had known the, 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 the right looking for. So again, here we have some limitations because if we having to know already for 1,000 pages where we are coming, where the right information is, why we should then train a system because then we have done a, a, again everything already by our own. So again, we have here this main issue that training a good system takes a lot of data and this data is not available currently. Um, I think uh, another possibility would be to create in the opposite an interface where different authorities can publish data too because this would um, split the effort to the different um, stakeholders, I would say, because they can then, each uh, municipality can then publish their data, then the, you can be right that this is the right data because they, they have taken over their res responsibility of publishing this data through this interface. And um, on the other hand side, you have a collected database where all the different information comes from in a standard format. But here is the, 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 the main challenge, how you them that they publish the data to your system. And uh, because they have already published it on their website for locally and from their point of view, I think it's right. It's the, they don't need to do more. So you, really, they, you have to see the, the, the main advantages they bring uh, in this kind of process. So this is um, what I really want to say here because it's it's here in for non-standard legal resources um, we have really this uh, challenging that we have of data sources yeah we you can write this kind of crawlers maybe for one for let's say twenty one hundred uh, selected sources. But to do it for all the different uh, websites here in Austria or over whole Europe, uh, I think um, it will not work. And, and this is another thing is that mm. it, it will not work uh, in a way um, that you having it uh, as a community action that there you will find a lot of developers over the whole Europe uh, doing some small development for you. 
can do it because this is not this let's say this this nice uh game you really uh Okay, uh, this is you cannot really make it like a, some gamification or um, an open innovation project. This is, I think, the, here here's the challenging part of it. I want to give you one short example. One second, hopefully it works. This is only a short example, um, only for a representation of search results. And if I type in Baurecht, so uh, construction thing, I'm getting information regarding the things. And if I have already an overview, these are the legal areas here in Austria. So I have something in, in Verfassung, uh, constitution right, um, in how the process right is, uh, own, even in civil right, uh, for another area for if I only add now additional sources to this kind of, of structure, it will add um, a lot of documents to this level yeah, where then I have not the, the overview anymore because I really could add, so I could add additional information I could add the different levels of the constitution and everything. But finally, um, it's not so easy to bring the, uh, additional data sources also in a graphical representation, which helps the customer. <laughs> the lawyer or some legal trained people um, on uh, in companies. So you can even uh, drill down to your, and I know currently uh, in, in, in government right um, in, on, uh, for schools, there is even 15 legislations uh, which have to do something with building constructions for schools. So this is already some breakdown. But if I add in this diagram additional resources um, for, let's say from the, Municipals, I'm suddenly getting to this 206, which I have at least, most likely, 2,900 um, additional results, which will be spread somewhere here in this uh, thing. And then something like this comes out. And then you have a structuring which is very small. And this does not give you uh, this high level overview anymore. So coming back to my presentation. Okay. So having seen this, so you really have to think also when you add additional sources and so on, how you structure your data afterwards for filtering and so on, because the only thing is helping your customers um, with, with your information is that he don't want to get a result set which is um, 1,000 documents. Is this? Because this does not help him because he wants to find the crucial documents. He wants to find the necessary documents to giving, giving the right advice or making the right decision. All the time uh, when lawyers are searching in legal databases or in legal systems, they want to find the right information and only the right information and they don't want to get uh, noisy uh, results because they uh, want to find the precise information. They are used to it, to giving so, uh, very clear information. Um, you even have if you add additional data services, you have to think about how you structure or uh, return the result set. For example, when I'm building regularly and first say I have this uh, on a, let's say on a national level, 
but also this information on a federal level, but the local level I would still exclude until someone is saying, I want to have building regulation for Salzburg city, for example, <clears throat> because then I know that he's really looking for very particular, Other, uh, as long as he's looking only for building regulation, I have, have to make this kind of assumption from the research point of view that he's only looking it on a general level because he's not looking for an, on a very specific, but where do you make this decision? Uh, uh, where do you make this decision that this, uh, this question is now a generic one and this gets now more specific? So this is more the challenging part here also to find out what is going on there. So, and now I'm coming back to my questions from the beginning of the presentation from Stephen and Danielle. Um, so you want to harvest now 1,000, uh, 10,000 of different websites. Um, did you have already thought about how you get this, all this different uh, scrappy, even if they are only five lines? What is your plan to do this? Yes. This question was also the, the end of, uh, of your presentation or is yeah. there still coming no, yes. more? So no, there is not coming okay. more. I'm, I'm, I'm more today more give, uh, asking <laughs> the questions, not giving uh -huh. the answers. <laughs> Okay, I, I think that's also, I, I was to the Switzerland seminar, academic seminar, there it is quite common to end the, the, uh, the presentation with a question to the audience. So you did the, the Switzerland style. Okay. Uh, maybe Stephen and Daniel, you can give us a very short answer and then we will uh, take time for the last uh, presentation from Gabor and then we have some two, uh, two questions in the chat and I think then we will have some 10 minutes at the end uh, for, for chatting and answering and, and questions in the chat. Stephen and Daniel, would you like to give us some very short answer? Certainly. I, uh, my I, connection broke up a little bit. No, I'll let go, please. Yeah, sorry about that. My microphone was actually off. No, that's a great question. Um, that's something no. that, we, that we've definitely um, have kept in mind. <clears throat> and I like that you brought up the, the automation process and, and intelligent crawling. We at the moment wanted to focus maybe on on a smaller set of states and try to see if we can build the the scraping by hand for all for all of those but like you mentioned um we have to anticipate changes to the to the website and all these different things so uh, machine learning is something that that is of high interest to me i haven't started piecing together how we could um how we could all connect it but i, I did see that you mentioned that you've Try to apply supervised machine learning, and you mentioned that you um, inter used like a thousand websites or something along those lines. So that's something that that we are cer certainly interested in. We just haven't applied it to the crawling process. So that's something that that we're very interested in. And and to tie it also to the to a point that was brought up earlier about using Google, another thing that we've been considering is uh, trying to use a search engine and trying to scrape those, considering those are in the, in in, the, in themselves crawlers that. That try to index the internet as well so we we figured there could be some value there um legal questions could come into play and, and all sorts of different things but intelligent crawling would be of high interest and um so yeah that's something and, and search engine scraping as well yeah and if i could add two things to, to daniel's answer i guess the first would be um Sometimes you have to worry about the past changing, but another thing is like things such as simple as CAPTCHA. So for instance, um, the Minneapolis Police Department has been under a lot of uh, attack recently because of the recent police brutality. And in response to stopping DDoS and cyber attacks, they put a CAPTCHA on their page. Those I'm sure many of you are aware that makes scraping a lot more difficult. So sometimes um, the modifications to the page are for security reasons that might make the automated process more difficult. Um, and then the second part, and this is something that I've heard in, I guess, a piece of each of the conversations, is almost that like if culturally we get all of our legislators from all of our respective countries and also the EU to kind of move, push to where they standardize how they're releasing, it would make all our jobs a lot easier. So it's almost like we're responding to the fire, but if we could almost like proactively stop the fire from happening and make sure that there's standardized resources at the time of issue, make this process for all of us a lot easier. So maybe a part of the answer is that we put a little bit of um, pressure, ask and advocate for our legislators to kind of use in a more like e-governance friendly way. Mm, okay. 
Thank okay. you. Okay, I think we should give the floor to our last lecturer, Gawa from the Technical University of Vienna. Thank you. Uh, also, please try to please share my uh, slides. Does this work? <clears throat> yes. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. Does it still work? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for for the invitation and for all the other talks. They they all did a great job in introducing the, talk, <clears throat> which saves me uh, some effort. And uh, I just have a few minutes worth of slides here because I was asked to just make um, a few remarks on on something that is. Uh, that is very often uh, a technical bottleneck, if not the technical bottleneck for, for projects like the ones uh, discussed here. Um, I'm an NLP engineer. NLP stands for Natural Language Processing, which is a collection of all kinds of uh, software technologies where your input and or output is natural language. And, um, and one bottleneck in all of these uh, projects that were mentioned uh, already, uh, is that uh, something that uh, all of you touched upon is that uh, the data itself that we are processing is in natural language and uh, getting the structure, the useful and the valuable structure out of it is in itself an effort. And uh, something I want to show you in these few minutes is that uh, the, the effort can, can, uh, can come at very different steps. Of, of this challenge, of this technique. Uh, and I just want to give you a few um, <clears throat> ideas here, how to how to start approaching a particular problem and a particular data set. So here I just have three examples of these non-standard data sets. We've seen similar things in the previous talks. Um, so uh, one of them is a uh, city of Salzburg uh, decree. Another one um, is, is uh, Com Austria, which is which is uh, an authority on on media law, uh, among other. Um, so this is this is what we're discussing. When when the sources are uh, are varied, they come in various formats. Now I want to call your attention to to a very a simple fact that we we can all look at each of these and uh, we have no problem understanding the structure, even though we might not be familiar with these formats. I am not a lawyer. I don't have to read documents like these all the time, and still I can look at any of them just because I'm an I'm a, a human being, and I know what to parse these visually, and know that <clears throat> there are headlines on these pages, that there are numberings, that there are uh, bulleted lists, uh, etc. Immediately, where, the, where if something is a date or something is a URL, so I'm. <clears throat> Parsing the semantics, I could say, of these pages immediately. And this is something that can be a huge challenge for computers. Uh, and we need to get the semantics of documents to make uh, even an application <clears throat> as straightforward as search meaningful. This screenshot is from the search engine of RIS, which is the source that my... Um, many of you mentioned today, the uh, central repository for Austrian uh, state and federal legislation. And uh, if you look at all the options, uh, this indicates, this, this tells us that they, they know this much about already, about the semantic, about the structure of each document in the repository, or at least most of them. Uh, dates, um, the organization that issued the legislation, what the title is, um, the numberings of, of the uh, sections and paragraphs. <clears throat> Just to create a user experience like this, or perhaps a somewhat better one, uh, but just to create a, uh, an efficient search engine for a set of documents, we need to get this, this uh, structure or something similar. And as was mentioned before, on the data level, on the computer's level, we just have PDFs and HTMLs. Also structured data, this is why it's not impossible to do this. But these, this is structure meant uh, for displaying the documents. This is, this is data <clears throat> that's meant for displaying the documents. 
Uh, PDFs uh, are, uh, and HTML are very different formats for very different uh, purposes, and I'm not going to go into that, but, but the structure of these data, data pieces was not meant for computers to further work with that structure. These are the structures that, these are the data types that you create when you're ready to display it to another human. So this is this is why we have a problem, and this is this is what can become a bottleneck for for many applications. And I just want to give a very um, bird's eye overview of of what the problems can be, what what the questions are that we have to answer uh, when we when we want to want to extract the structure of these documents. <clears throat> the first one that doesn't even always come to mind: which parts do we keep? Uh, I'm always listing some technical terms also for these questions, just if, just so that if some of these are familiar to you, that then you then you know that uh, this is part of this level of structure extraction. Um, we have to detect the layout of a page and decide which parts are the good parts, the ones that we care about. Uh, we want to detect if, uh, the characters if it's if it's one of those um, documents where it's actually a scan of an image of a text. Uh, we want to remove uh, <clears throat> Then we want to, we want to have that structure that is encoded by the layout. What are the sections? What are the paragraphs? Um, and then which are the individual sentences and what are the words of those sentences? Um, there are many cases, this is why uh, people uh, have a hard time realizing when it's actually very hard. And it can be a, a really, really big problem if, uh, if based on a little bit of experience, one considers these problems to be easy because it was easy on the last data set. <laughs> and it turns out to be very difficult on the next. And finally, uh, for the most valuable pieces of information, uh, we want to know what the text is about. Yeah. So among other things, among the full hard task of natural language understanding, which is very difficult. Um, but just to find keywords or just to find the most important entities in a text. So I don't have to be, I don't have to have domain expertise, for example, to look at a piece of legislation and tell you all the, all the organizations and all the persons that were mentioned in them. If you are able to do that automatically with a piece of software for a particular domain, for example, Austrian legislation, you have done something very valuable uh, because that, that enables a wide variety of applications. Um, and the main takeaway, and this is, this is the question that I, that I uh, really uh, want to um, stress here, that any of these steps and any of the individual technical tasks that are here listed with the smaller print uh, are sometimes very easy and sometimes very hard. And you cannot generalize. And there is no rule of thumb about which of these are easy and which of these are hard because it depends on so many factors. It depends on what your data source is. It depends on what the domain is. It depends on the quality of the data sets. It depends on the language of the data set and a variety of other factors. So you have to uh, be able to um, uh, look at a new problem with a new domain and a new data set and determine which of these will be the, the, the real pains, which of these will turn out to be the bottlenecks in your, in your new project or in your new application. And for this process, I just want to give a few pieces of general advice. And this is my last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, data specialists, NLP specialists, uh, rank these tasks by doability or risk. Um, this is to say, um, it's not that only they can, that's not what is meant here. <laughs> what is meant here is um, uh, they should be consulted if, uh, uh, if all we had <clears throat> experience from a previous project, maybe something was very easy on the last data set and it's much more difficult on the next. On the other hand, this, this misunderstanding happens the other way around. 
it is the domain experts who who need to be consulted on which of these steps are most important for a given use case, a given business case. So it also happens the other way around at the end as success with a particular uh, with a particular data extraction step, and they want to uh, push it when it's not that valuable for the use case. And the very important, maybe the most important one, everyone, so both domain experts, business experts, data specialists, should always spend some time looking at the data. It is a mistake to think that uh, this is the task of only one or two uh, people at the table. Everybody can gain very valuable insight by always looking at the data that they are processing in the rawest form possible. And this is, this is a general advice also used in software development, but also very relevant here. All the assumptions about what the data contains and what it doesn't, and which, which of these tasks are easy to solve and which are difficult to solve, all these assumptions should be tested early and tested often. Thank you. These were uh, these uh, short remarks, and I hope I left some time for questions. Yes, we have some some minutes, I think. So, of course, we have some some remark from Susanne Kaff that we should come to the end and join the uh, the main stage for the wrap up. But there are still some minutes left, I think. So, uh, we have some some thirty minutes ago or something in the middle of of Christian Sagedas. Uh, lecture slides. We have a question of of Julia Moore Kelly. Where these data sources uh, for I think Cybly come from? Maybe you can answer this. And also, I just want to invite all these twenty um, listeners. If you have some more questions, please feel free to type in in the chat. I think we can spend some some five minutes or so uh, for for answering or making some nice chat proceedings and. Join the main stage a little bit late. <laughs> so, Christian, what, what are the data sources come from? Data slightly? sources comes from open data interfaces. Uh, Reese, for example, have an open database. Eurolex mm. have an open database, so you have to register for them to get access to this data. But in general, this data is, mm. is public available. Also, for example, for Germany. Um, it's differently uh, on for other data sources. Um, maybe in Italy, this uh, I know this uh, this data is not public available even even if you are looking there. So they don't allow to process their data, which they which for the legislation and so on. Okay. But yes, in, are there any more? Mm -hmm. I can give you an, yeah, also please, an answer. Please. For example, um, from Stefan Hasenauer, he. Uh, Presented that um, for the worker agreements, um, um, owns data, and this is right. And this data is owned from the Chamber of Commerce on the one hand side, and uh, on the other hand side of for the Labour Party. And this is a main <laughs> issue because you don't get access to this data because no one of them have the own right of the data. So this is a funny mm. fact here in Austria, and all, even there are not all uh, data included. For example, um, this data, for example, for artists, lawyers, and so on, are not at this information because these are again uh, additional yeah, parties, uh, uh, agreements, and so on, um, which is their responsibilities. So even you know, for example, certain data sets you don't get even the data or you can mm. reuse it. And I know it from a project here in Austria, we have approximately a few hundred. I know it from Spain, they have a several 10,000 because there must be for each company, even if there's an agreement, they have to publish it. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there some more questions in the chat? Maybe someone? Uh -huh. wants to specify something daniel yeah i wanted to ask um gabor a question from the for the nlp talk that was very interesting um in there you mentioned <clears throat> um analyzing the documents and, and trying to extract uh, meaningful um meaning from them or using nlp and something i wanted to ask you is there a problem that that gets presented with uh 
with the language barrier, the, some of the orders being in different languages and how you have to, I know for NLP, sometimes you have to use a dictionary to, to chunk up the words and something like that. So is that, is that a problem that you've come across? Um, you mean which language, the da- with what is the language of the data, whether, yes, exactly. in fact, that is one of the dimensions that can, vary, that can change which, which of these tasks are difficult. I can I can give I can give an example of of tasks that are especially di- difficult for okay. German. Okay, um, welcome again. Uh, human rights. <laughs> I'm the fighter for human rights. Uh, this time, human rights for eating, drinking, and music. Sorry, guys, it's the right. end of the story. <laughs> Thomas, mm-hmm. say goodbye, and then it's it. Mm-hmm. Next time. Yeah, there is session. no possibility to. to... To see you possibly in a in a conference dinner or something like this. This is the very big disadvantage of these virtual conferences. But I think maybe next year we will meet all physically and also during the evening afterwards. So thanks for all your presentations, for the ideas you brought to us. We developed this a little bit in discussing. We we can proceed this. And now I just invite you to follow the wrap up at the main stage. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, come to this. Okay. So thanks, goodbye, and see you. I don't know, some next time since they well. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Goodbye.